Welcome to Electron Online. Here is another example of how to use the method of sections to find the forces on the members, in this case of a truss. This is a roof truss. Notice the dimension. It's 8 meters from A to B, from B to C, C to D, and D to E. It's 6 meters from here to there, and 6 meters from there to there. So it's a large structure. We're trying to find the force between C and D and C and H, and we're going to use the method of sections for that. Here's the section drawn out in order to be able to accomplish finding the forces on those two members. First, what we need to do is find the force at E, the supporting force here, and also the force at A. We can do this in two ways. One of them could be by taking the moment about point A. It tells us that the sum of all the moments about point A must add up to zero. And if we add them all up, of course, these two forces will cancel out because the action of the force goes right to the pivot point. But here we have a force. Notice that these are numbers in kilonewtons. So this is three kilonewtons and six kilonewtons and so forth. We'll just write the numbers three and six. Uh, notice that this will give us a clockwise torque. That means we have a negative six newtons times the perpendicular distance of eight meters. And here we have another six newtons, but again it'll be negative six newtons. Again, these are kilonewtons really. And that would be for a distance of 16 meters. And here we have another negative six kilonewtons times a distance of 24 newtons and a three kilonewtons and a distance of 32 meters and I guess I should put meters in here and finally we have the force at E that would be plus the force at E y plus because that will give us a counterclockwise torque in this direction and that would be times 32 meters if we sum all these up what we get is we get the following we get the force at E is equal to so what we're doing is we're taking all these and moving to the other side of the equal sign and setting it equal to this so force at E is equal to the sum of all these, that would be 48 plus 96 plus 144 plus 96, and the whole thing divided by the coefficient, 32. That gives us a force of, if that, I'm going to need a calculator. So 48 plus 96 plus 96 plus 144, divide that by... 32 and you get exactly 12. So 12 kilonewtons is the supporting force here at E. So we'll go ahead and plug that number in. Another way to solve this is to realize that in the vertical direction, the sum of all the forces in the y direction should add up to zero. So we could have also said that the sum of all the forces in the y direction must add up to zero. We have a force at A that's in the positive direction and we have a force at E in the positive direction, and that should equal all the negative forces pushing down. These are all the loads on the truss. That would be minus three, and we have minus six, minus six, minus six. Oh, actually, I shouldn't put an equal sign there. I should simply subtract them from the total. If I put an equal sign there, I have two equal signs, so I'm going to do that, minus three, and all that should add up to zero. I was wondering I was going to be out by a negative sign. Finally, I can then say that the force of A plus the force at E must add up to, when I bring this to the other side, 18 plus 6, that's 24 kilonewtons. Now notice that there's perfect symmetry here, which means the force at A must be exactly equal to the force at E. Since the force at A must equal the force at E, that means that each one of them must carry half the total load or 12 kilonewtons. That would be another way to find the force, the supporting force at the endpoints. Now going on to the business of finding the force between C and D and the force between C and H. Let's start off with finding the force between C and D. And to do that, we're going to take a pivot point right here. Notice by Picking the pivot point right there, we're eliminating all three of these forces right there. It would make the problem a lot easier. And here now we realize that this is 12 kilonewtons. I don't want to put the kilonewtons there, just simply 12 kilonewtons to be understood. And we're going to put the pivot point at H, so the sum of all the moments at H should add up to zero. 
The first four we have here, the first force, is the 12 kilonewtons in this direction that gives us a counterclockwise torque, which is negative. Oh, nope, that's positive. That's equal to 12 times the distance from the line of action of the force to the pivot point that would be the 8 meters right here. That's 8 meters. We have the minus 3, minus 3 kilonewtons, also times 8 meters. And now we have the force here, CD, and that will give us a clockwise torque about point H, that's minus force at CD, which is what we're looking for, times the distance between the line of action of force and the pivot point, which would be the 6 meters indicated right there, that's 6 meters. Now we're ready to find force CD. Force CD is equal to moving this over to the other side, it becomes positive. That is equal to 12 times 8, which is 96, minus 3 times 4, which is 24, and then divide by the coefficient here, 6. 96 minus 24, that's 72 divided by 6, which is equal to 12, and again, that would be kilonewtons. So the force on member CD is 12 kilonewtons. Now also notice that I'm assuming that the force is in this direction. That puts this member under tension. Let me use a different color so you can see it. So the assumption was that member CD was under tension. That would then indicate that this force would be emanating from D in this direction. Since I have a positive answer there, I then confirm that yes indeed, that member is under tension. Next we're going to try to find the force between C and H. Force between C and H is equal to question mark. For that, we have to pick a different pivot point. Let's pick pivot point at E. That way we eliminate those two forces right here. We would also eliminate this unknown force from G to H. So let's pick the pivot point at E. The sum of all the moments about point E must add up to zero. We can also eliminate CD because that also goes to this pivot point. So all three of these forces are eliminated. So is this one with only these two forces left. So let's pick this one first. This will give us a counterclockwise torque about point E. That would be a positive torque, positive moment. This is equal to 6 times the distance from there to there. That's an 8 meter distance. So times 8 meters. And it's positive because it's a counterclockwise torque. And now we also have this one right here, and this would also give us a counterclockwise torque about point E. It would be plus force at CH multiplied times the perpendicular distance from the line of action of the force to the pivot point. Or another way we can think about it is, since that would be acting here at point C as well, this very same force, and we can simply multiply this distance here times the angle here to get the equivalent perpendicular distance. What we're going to do here is multiply this times this distance, which is 16 meters, times the cosine of this angle, the cosine of theta. Now, we don't know yet what theta is, but we can use the arctangent, which by definition is the opposite over the adjacent. So this angle, the opposite side would be this distance right here, which is 8 meters. Adjacent side is this distance, which is 6 meters, so 8 divided by 6. And then I need to find the tangent of that, or the arctangent, so 8 divided by 6. Take the inverse tangent of that and I get 53.13 degrees. 53.13 degrees, which I can plug in here. Now notice I need to find this. So I take the force at CH is equal to, when I move this across the other side, I get a negative 48. And then I divide that by the coefficient here, which is 16 times the cosine of, and now we know the angle, 53.13 degrees. Notice 16 goes into 48 three times. This is equal to minus 3 divided by the cosine of 53.13 degrees. And let's see what that is equal to. Take the cosine of that, which is 0.6. This is equal to minus 3 divided by 0 0.6, which is equal to minus 5. And again, the units would be kilonewtons. Now notice we got a negative in this case. Again, the assumption was, based upon the way it was drawn, that this was under tension. Actually, we don't just normally assume that. The typical methodology for using the method of sections is to draw all the forces away from the points of the section. So we just simply do that 
as a standard practice. And if we get a negative answer, that simply means that the force is in the opposite direction, which means the force is really in this direction. That means we actually have a force of compression. So we can simply take, put the C there. So this member is under tension, and this member here is under compression, because we drew it as if it was tension, but we got a negative answer, which means it's under compression. And that's how we find the forces of any member of any structure like a bridge or a truss by simply cutting off the point where we want to find the information. We then draw the section by itself. We then draw all the external forces acting on the section, the force of all the members plus all the loads plus the support forces. Here's another load force. And then we simply use the same methodology again. We do the sum of all the moments about a point to find the unknowns. And in some cases, of course, you need to find the angle and multiply it times the cosine of the angle to get the equivalent distance or the effective torque, the effective moment about the point that you're interested in. And that's how we find the forces on these particular members. It's actually pretty nice to be able to do it like this. It's a lot quicker than going through each member all the way from one point to the other side. That takes a lot more time. That's how it's done.